listening to the speeches in this place today, it does feel like we live in two different worlds. On our side have been people uh, really speaking about the pain and distress that, that our constituents are experiencing now. And yet I have heard so little of that from the other side. Uh, I don't know if it's that they don't know it or don't see it or just don't want to talk about it. But it, it's been really stark. Uh, and certainly listening to the member for Debell uh, and her plea that pharmacists really get brought in, and I'm looking forward to that rolling out because we have very similar problems in the Blue Mountains and the Hawkesbury that she describes on the Central Coast. I absolutely support getting this bill through Parliament. I support whatever financial assistance there's going to be to help people. But it is week six of the lockdown. And in the last week, the conversations I've had with individuals and small businesses have been those of despair because so many have not yet seen a cent of support come through to them. Now, these are tough, resilient people. We've been through fires and we've been through floods. We've had the first lot of COVID. But this last wave has been more profound. Uh, I heard the Prime Minister say a couple of weeks ago, oh, people have built up a buffer in the last six months. Well, I don't know where he's been talking to people. Perhaps that's big business, but small businesses in my community, in most sectors, particularly hospitality, anything involving tourism, there's no buffer. That buffer's gone, and this one is really hurting. The, I've had people in tears. Uh, it isn't unusual for my office to have people uh, describing their distress in emails, but also phoning us and, and having conversations. A and they are literally in tears, partly because of the confusion about the payments and the lack of clarity in this system and the fact that they have to wait on the phone for hours and hours, particularly with Services New South Wales, to see if they meet the very strict eligibility criteria for the business stuff. Because they can't apply for the Commonwealth COVID disaster payment till they know for sure that they're not going to get the state one. Because these things don't work together. They work against each other. Uh, and, and just as I was coming down into the chamber, I had uh, um, I had a, a people messaging me just saying, I have just spent another four hours on the phone waiting, or I've spent a couple of hours on the phone. They told me yesterday I was eligible, but nothing, nothing has come through. I really can't stress how profound this financial anxiety is that's being created, and the Prime Minister bears responsibility for it. I know he's tried to pass business off and say that's for the states, but in the end he's had to come on board and recognise that the states are not going to provide the sort of support that's needed. And I'll talk about JobSaver in a moment. I really want to clarify that when I talk small business, I'm not talking businesses with a $50 million a year turnover. I'm talking small businesses. Some of them are micro-businesses. They're sole traders, they're partnerships, they're uh, family businesses. They might be mum running a business while parenting. They might be older workers who've chosen self-employment. They're tradies, they're creatives. They're people trying to turn their passion into a steady income. And and they are the people who are really struggling, and the system the government has chosen is fraught for them. The first grants that were offered by the state were just never going to be a targeted and appropriate response to the start of what everyone could see would be a long lockdown. And the Job Saver program does fall short. It doesn't even keep the positives of JobKeeper, and it creates a whole lot of other gaps in it. Um, there's been I think what gets me is there's been 18 months to get this system right. This is not just something that happened yesterday. This is something that we had an opportunity to respond to a year ago, over a year ago, and then look at that response and go, how could we have done it better? And that's what a decent government would have done. That's what a competent government would have done. But it's not what this government has done. I think there was a whole lot of, oh, great, we got through that. There we go. Nothing to worry about now, mate. She'll be right. Uh, let's all sit back and relax. And that complacency is causing enormous stress in the electorate of Macquarie. 
What we're seeing is not a plan, but something that's being done on the run. It's being announced at media conferences and sometimes updated within 24 hours to try and plug the gaps. And then we don't see any detail for weeks and weeks and weeks. Or in the case of the legislation today, we've got legislation to make good what was ad hoc, an ad hoc announcement that the Prime Minister made around the disaster payment not being taxed, which is quite different to JobKeeper, and that's one of the things we obviously have to fix today. Now, if you run a business the way this government has rolled out financial support, you'd be out of business. You wouldn't deserve to be in business. And sadly, the consequence of this, though, could be that some businesses in my area go out of business. And it will be a failure of this government if they don't survive through this COVID wave. You know, as I said, they've been through fire, flood, COVID and another flood. And I've just never seen people as strung out as they are now. And we're not in the harshest lockdown areas. But parents are supervising schooling at home. Teachers are trying to teach remotely, but also plan to be back in the classroom. Uh, seniors are isolated. They're losing those important incidental community contacts, like the chat you have when you go shopping, which they're told they're not allowed to have anymore. Construction workers who suddenly had to secure their sites and abandon work Builders tell me that a two-week shutdown is going to take weeks to recover from because of the time lag of materials, which are, were already in short supply and times were really pressured. It's an intricate job that they do, with lots of moving parts, and you get one bit wrong and the rest falls apart. The small micro-businesses who don't meet the criteria they might have been affected by bushfires and they've never really been able to recover, or they might have grown significantly since 2019. And so they don't look like they've suffered as much as they actually are. And for tourism, people like the coach drivers and the, the family companies owning coaches and minibuses, they, they've just been left abandoned anyway. And, and this is another nail in the coffin because the support is so confusing. And that makes it really hard for people to plan their spending. And in fact, that's having a flow on consequence to restaurants and cafes. Um, you know, they have valiantly switched to takeaway. And the smaller ones, uh, some of them are telling me they're quite busy. But many can see that there just isn't as much money in the community as there, as there was last time we went through this. Uh, which is why the Prime Minister's comment that people have built up a buffer just does not ring true. You know, and these businesses, many of them are paying extra overheads because they're repaying the extra on their deferred mortgage or loan from last time. They're really stretched. The demand for emergency food is up, and there's your evidence that people are doing it tough. Every single service I've spoken to tells me they're seeing people they've never seen before who've needed, never needed to reach out for help. And much of this is because of the Morrison government's failure to work with New South Wales to ensure that the support was there right from the start, not week three or five or, as we are now, week six. There's also been a huge personal toll that this has taken. I've got the family trying to get a visa in a lockdown city for a rising javelin star so she can take up her US college scholarship. I've got the apprentices under 17 who are missing out on any financial support, the people who just lost a job right before lockdown and they've seen not a single extra cent on the job seeker payment. I've got people like Chris who's a music teacher and has lost hundreds of dollars in income but less than the minimum eight hours a week who's now got to find a way to pay his mortgage. I've got the mum who's worried about the mental health of her daughter, locked down on her own and working from home in the inner west. There's Rochelle, who's a wheelchair-bound uh, woman, um, a very strong woman, and, but she requires special care and without access to her usual hairdressing salon, she can't have her hair washed. And the advice she was given by uh, the New South Wales government was that she could lie on the grass to do it. The parents and early childcare operators, who are each in a terrible position with the voluntary waiver of the gap fee, but not a cent of support for the centres to provide it. And then we've got flood victims whose repairs had to stop when they were so close to being able to go back home five months after the floods. So much of this could have been avoided had the Prime Minister just done his job, in fact his two jobs. We wouldn't be here if he'd done the things he needed to, if he hadn't been complacent during summer, if he'd used the time to make good progress. We needed 
the dedicated purpose-built quarantine facilities happening. The delay in doing this has literally cost lives and livelihoods, and he needed to get us enough vaccines and enough variety of vaccines to be able to vaccinate us, lots of us. Now, we hear, I'll finish, Deputy Speaker, by just talking about the reality of trying to get a vaccine in the Hawkesbury or the Blue Mountains. There is the most cumbersome and flawed booking system that's about as effective as the COVID app. And it's no wonder a clever software developer has created a shortcut site uh, to help people find appointments at the big vaccine hubs, although sadly it doesn't cover my electorate. Instead, people are sharing tips and many just resorting to either waiting till September or October for an appointment or they're travelling into the more intense hotspots if they can get an appointment to get to a hub. But we need our own hub. Constituents are reporting cancellations of appointments for Pfizer in order for the Year 12 students in, more, uh, in the, in the hot, real hotspots to um, be protected, and they understand that, but they want to know when are we going to be able to have it. People can't fathom why you can't get an AstraZeneca appointment when everyone is saying there is so much of it washing around. The bottom line is it's a mix of supply issue but also a workforce issue. The, both councils have offered to set up a hub, but we'd still need the people. And the confusion of the proclamations by the Prime Minister, you know, the Friday night breathless announcements that either induce panic or are unintelligible, don't engender confidence that we're going to see the things we need to see so that everyone can be vaccinated. It is hurting the mental and and it's hurting the mental health of my community and it's hurting people financially. We had an advantage. It was squandered by this government, by this Prime Minister. And while we recognise in the Blue Mountains and Haw Hawkesbury how lucky we are to be able to exercise in World Heritage Area, what we also know is that things are tough and they're tough for our neighbours. Uh, of course, this is a time for us to be grateful, but if ever there was a time for us to walk in someone else's shoes, now is the time. And we think of those with very harsh lockdowns. Uh, but we urge this government to do the right thing, pull the finger out, and let's get this vaccination program rolling out properly.